esteem the other more highly than yourself, to treat each other as brothers and sisters in the Lord, and to, uh, you know, to be kind, loving, kind one to another. That's how we approach each other. We approach God with humility and humbleness and giving God all the glory and all the credit. Not one ounce of credit belongs to me when it comes to anything that God does. But there are other things that are credit to you and I. The Bible said to give double honor to whom double honor is due. And so there are certain things that we, it's okay to honor each other and to say, I appreciate this one. Thank you for the 30 years of service. Thank you for 40 years of work in the Sunday school. You're awesome. You're great. And we know, we understand when we say that. We're not saying you're awesome like God's awesome. But it's all right to get on that level with each other and to say, I love you. I appreciate you. You're doing a great job. Or I've got hopes and faith and prayer that this year will be a better year for you or whatever. But we approach God with humility, humbleness of mind, knowing that all the things that God does, he gets all the credit. We praise him for every bit of it. We can't heal anybody. We can't save anybody. We can't function in the church by ourselves. We can't sing, lead, uh, choir, or praise teams, or usher, or Sunday school, or youth department, or pastor, or associate pastor, our evangelists, without the mighty help of God, and we give him all the credit and all the glory. That's how you approach your God, realizing how good God has been to every one of us. And then once again, when we approach each other, we approach each other with an equalization, that we're brothers and sisters. We're equal in the Lord. And it doesn't matter what your uh, annual income is or anything of that nature. You walk in these doors, you're my brother, you're my sister, And I'll treat you with the same love and courtesy as I expect to be treated by anybody else. But then when it comes to your enemy, you've got to learn how to stand your ground and tell the devil, I am a child of God. I'm born again. I've got the Spirit of God inside of me. You're a liar. I'll have nothing to do with you. Get behind me, Satan. Thou savoreth not the things that be of God. You've got to learn those three kind of attitudes. Come before God with thanksgiving and humbleness of mind, body, and spirit. Treat each other on an equal with each other and uh, respect each other, love each other, be loving, kind to each other. But when it comes once again to your enemy, the devil, not people. People are not your enemy. The devil is your enemy. One third of the angels that fell from heaven, that is your enemy. And uh, the enemy uses who he will, but we've got to see beyond that. And uh, that's why, not that the United States and its functions, trust me, not the United States and its functions is correct or right in everything that it says and does. I'm not an anti-American But uh, I have enough sense to know that uh, people that make decisions, that don't make decisions in the fear of God, the Bible, the Word of God, are going to make terrible errors. We know that just happened in St. Louis, Missouri, where a young man, right or wrong, was uh, shot and killed by an officer. And the the boy didn't even have a gun. And we don't know all the circumstances, but I'm just saying that's something that's there on the horizon that we're, we're, we're all aware of. And uh, it's a terrible tragedy, but that's what the world is all about. They, they just don't know what's going on. They, they, they attack the wrong enemy. They don't know who the real enemy is. And, uh, but we know who the real enemy is. It's Satan, devil, Beelzebub, Lucifer, and one-third of those angels that fell that was under his charge. Three archangels, Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer. Did you know Lucifer was a created angel of God? He was one of the... Three archangels. Archangels have four faces to see in four different directions with four different uh, attributes and characteristics. It's recorded in Ezekiel and uh, in Jeremiah about the, the cherubims, and that's who those archangels are, the cherubims. And, uh, and when Lucifer fell, he took one-third. There was one-third of the angels that was under his charge and under his authority. And they followed him all the way into all of the mischief, sin, and disobedience. And so he doesn't deserve our respect. He doesn't deserve to be cut in his slack. He's out to kill, steal, and destroy. He's behind every broken home. He's behind every physical 
breaking of health. All of that, there, God did not, I had a man ask me one time, if God's so great, God's so full of love, then why are babies dying and this happening, tornadoes and hurricanes and earthquakes? I said, God didn't do that. God didn't create the world like that. You see, all of that happened whenever man joined up with the devil and agreed with him instead of agreeing with God. And, and the world took a change, and man took a change, and woman took a change, and we became the servants and servitude, the slaves of Satan. But Jesus came back in the flesh. Satan used man to bring the kingdom of God down, and God used a man to bring the kingdom of God back up. And every time God uses you, Every time God uses me, it's in the devil's face. That's why the devil is after you because you are, you are a weapon of God. You are in the hands of God. You are a sword of God. You are a glory unto God. You're a reminder to the devil that his days are numbered and that he is doomed and there's no way out. And it's a reminder that whatever Satan did to defeat man, God can do it in reverse in a better, more glorious way. That's why the enemy doesn't want you healed, doesn't want you feel, doesn't want you thrilled, doesn't want you touched by God. But greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. There are more that be for you that, than be against you. So you need to make your mind up in this service today. I will rebuke, attack, dishonor the devil. I will give honor to God and glory to God and I will humble myself to God and I will love everybody around me, saved or unsaved. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. Reach over and get someone by the hand. I want you to just pray whether you can grab your, grab, put your mind around what I just said. When you get someone by the hand and just squeeze it and say, I agree in Jesus' name that I'm going to have those kind of three attitudes in my living for God from this morning forward. That that's what I'm going to do in the name of Jesus. And everybody say amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. It's always good to be in church. I love going to church. I never get tired. Something I've been doing now for 43 years, I never get tired of being in the house of God. I never get tired of church. I, I have shouted before. I've shouted one night. I shouted so much. I said, God, if you don't let up, I'm going to blow up. I can't take this anymore. And it left off, it lifted off of me for about 25, 30 seconds, and it came back on me again. And I said, why fight something that's good? Kind of reminds me of the lemon cake in my refrigerator a couple of months ago. And I told Sister Winslow, I want to try to lose a few pounds. And I said, evangelizing, it's hard to, you know, stay trim and thin. And, uh, but uh, I said, I'm just going to eat a little slither of this cake. And I want you to know that when I went to sleep, it started talking to me from the refrigerator. It called me into action. And I went in there and I said, I'm going to put a hurt on you for talking to me and waking me up. You won't be talking to me after this. And I mean, I put a hurt on that cake like nobody has ever since the day of Adam and Eve. And uh, I, I, I munched on that cake and drank milk and, man, it was great. And we need to put the hurt on the devil today by eating all that God's got for us, by receiving everything that God has got for us. Now, I was... I've been to this church many times, and I'm always amazed and appreciative to the ministry of this church, the leaders of this church. And, uh, you know, you don't always get to preach for, I don't, I'm not saying this about any preacher, that they're, they're not great preachers, but you don't get to preach for people that are so faithful and stay with it and are, have the stickability and the, the character to be honest and, and to walk with God like Brother Nelson Sr. and uh, Brother Nelson Jr. I don't, he's not a junior, but Brother Nelson, pastor and bishop. And, uh, and it's just always great to come and see what the Lord is doing and see how the Lord is doing it. And uh, see men that are called of God, that are honest, that you can trust. And it's, up to, it's the enemy that would love for us not to see that or understand that or appreciate that. You ought to get up every day while you're thanking God for everything God's done for you. You ought to always thank God for a man of God in your life that is seeking the face of God and directing the church and is giving his life to the Lord. If you think it's easy, believe me when I tell you this, it is not an easy task. 
Your pastor could be the CEO of a great corporation and not have to do as much as he does or, or stress and reach and believe as much as he does in this church. And he is the CEO of a great organization in San Jose, California. And that's the house of God, the church of the living God. And that's who you are. And I, I want to give honor to them and a, appreciation to them. When that, God always has a plan. Trust me, God never leaves us without a plan. When our plans don't always happen like we think they ought to happen, and uh, pain comes and disillusionment and our dreams are broken, God picks us up and he heals us and he starts putting our life back together again and sowing into our life uh, important components of our life. There is no man that is capable of walking by himself without God in his church and no pastor is capable of being the kind of man of God he can be without a good Holy Ghost woman that is sown into his life by the Lord. I've listened to your pastor and listen to his conversations about this church and about his mission and God's call in his life to this church. He did not want to take this church without the voice of God and the opinion of the people. And he did not want a bride. He did not want a wife unless it was something God wanted to sow into his life. And he has very, uh, uh, very honestly walked with God about everything about this church and everything about his personal life. How many thank God that God is able to put our lives back together again and put someone into our life to help heal us and to give us help and give us direction? The Lord spoke to me about Sister Nelson, and he told me, he said, I'm going to send seven angels into her life. And there are going to be seven anointings and seven doors that are going to open up in her ministry and in her life. The Lord said, this year, I'm going to wake her up to her ministry, that she has a ministry in this church and a ministry in the life of the pastor of this church. God said, I'm going to start sending the angel of wisdom and knowledge and understanding. And you'll find the seven angels in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. And you'll see those seven angels that are going to touch her life with understanding, wisdom, and knowledge. And... Uh, and she has a ministry. And after I get through preaching today, I may or may not pray for her depending on what God wants. But after this service is over with today, she is going to start walking in a great ministry in her life. And God's going to start using her. And, and uh, every church needs a woman of God in the pulpit and in the pews and in the pastor's life. And I'm just so thrilled that, that not that, Brother Nelson needs anything from me on, on those lines, but I'm so glad that I know for a surety that God has sowed a woman of God with character and principle and the Spirit of God in her life to walk beside her husband, to love her man, to love this church, and to walk in the Holy Ghost. And you're going to be proud of her, and you're going to see the anointing of God in her life, and you're going to see her grow unbelievably with great anointing and great expectation. And she is going to make this church so proud. Well, I wonder if I put any load on her today. Glory to God. I wonder if anybody's got a reason to seek the Lord in Jesus' name. But let's give the woman of God a hand clap of appreciation for standing by her man. Now, I don't want to go in great, great detail about this, but I will just mention this, and I'm going to move on. I'm not going to say much about it. God's people was the Jews. They were chosen by God. They were meant to, to usher in all the prophetic promises of God. But it was the Jews that backed up and walked away from their promise. And so the Lord raised up somebody else. It was a Gentile bride. And she became the bride of Jesus Christ. And the prophetic utterance and the prophetic prophecies and the power of God flowed through her just like it did through Israel. I want you to know that God's got his hand on this house. God's got his hand on the man of God, the woman of God. God's got his hand on your life. You're going to be so glad you came to this service this morning because God is going to put a prophetic blessing on this church this morning that's going to break the gates of hell, that's going to open up the floodgates of the supernatural, that's going to bring restoration and power into your family, into your life. If 
you're about to give up, you better change your opinion because you're just a few moments away from a supernatural anointing of God that's going to carry you into the rapture of the church. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise and get ready for the supernatural this morning. And of course, I didn't say much about your bishop, but you know, I love your bishop and he's such an amazing dude. <laughs> I didn't laugh at him, so don't tell him this, but just knowing him sitting on the side of Interstate 5, I bet he was fit to be tied. Hallelujah. Because he was, I guarantee he told Sister Nelson, I've got better things to do than this. I, I guarantee he said, if I knew this, I'd stayed around and done something around the house of God. But uh, they were on their way and they arrived. And thank God for the bishop. Now this morning, I wanna, I'm just going to do what God asked me to do. That's all I can do. I can't do any more than that. And uh, I can do a whole lot less, but I can't do any more than that. I can only do what God tells me, allows me, speaks to me. Do anything else is wasted energy, confuses everything. And, uh, and so I want to tell you this morning that you've got to listen very careful to this. And you've got to pay attention. You've got to let God do this for you. And once you do it, you've got to stand on it. Everything about God is about faith. And you know what faith is. Faith is not feeling. Faith is not what you see. Faith is what you believe. Everybody expects as soon as they get a word from God or somebody lays hands on them, and many times we do, but everybody expects to see lightning bolts and hear thunder, and, and it doesn't always work that way. But some of the greatest things God does, you just slip into it. You just stand in faith and believe it. Now, I've, I've, I'm not, I wouldn't dare say, nor do I even believe, that I've seen more miracles than anybody else, but I've seen my share of miracles. One day I was preaching, and the Lord said, you're not going to preach. I want you to start telling. Go back as far as you can, and I want you to tell people the miracles that you've been a part of and the miracles that you've seen. And so I just started telling one miracle after the other. Didn't have time to talk much about it, but I would just, and I mean, boy, it wasn't very long until I just, I was caught up into a realm of anointing and faith and possibility in my own life as I began to remember all the things that I had seen in my life, that God had done in my life, that I would seen happen, perform in the miraculous. And then in January, after God prophesied and spoke a word to me in November, every November God speaks seven things to me about the coming year. Uh, 2013, God told me there would be a year of great Miracle conception, couples trying to have children. And just all 2013, it was just crazy with the number of conceptions. Call people out. You have tried to have children. Yes, we are. Laid hands on them and they conceived. And uh, the babies are still being born because when 14 started in January, God said, that's going to stay with you the rest of your ministry. And you are you are going to be praying and, and uh, uh, I'm going to use you to pray for those that are saddened and burdened because they have no children. And, uh, I mean, me, I could think it to have a baby. I mean, well, my wife could. I mean, you know, I don't know why. We just, uh, glory to God, we just had to be careful. We could have children just so easy. And Sister Winslow, 20 minutes of labor, and that, those babies would be born. I mean, she just did not labor very long. And I remember sliding into the emergency room. We had got stuck in a snow uh, pile. And I'd got some, an old man and a couple of people pushed me out of that snow pile. And so she was about to have the baby. And we came up in the emergency room and I said, she's fixing to have this baby. Oh, yeah, okay, right, yeah. I said, no, I'm telling you, she's going to have it right now. How long has she been in labor? About 30 minutes. Okay, well, you sit down and calm down. All right. But when she took her in there and examined her, she come running out of there. Call the doctor now. I said, I told you, I told you, as she ran by me and ignored me. And so, Sister Winslow, she's a baby factory. Now, that don't glorify her, so don't tell her that. No, that's not going to make her feel good. Don't say that to her. But we prayed, and God was able to touch so many people and is still doing it in 2014. And then in November, God spoke to me about 2014, and he said, this shall be the year of Elisha. And he said, Elisha 
did 14 national miracles and did twice as many as Elisha did. And the Lord said, 2014 is the year of the double portion. And I'm going to double up on the miracles. I'm going to double up on the power. And I mean this year from January, I've seen more miracles in this short span of months than I've seen any other time in that time frame. I've never seen as much. North Little Rock just a few weeks ago, people walking out of there carrying their canes and pushing their uh, wheelchairs and, I mean, just watching them walk out of that service as God began to uncripple them. The knots, the nodules, the cancers, the tumors. I've never seen so many stage four cancer miracles since January in all of my ministry and anywhere. I've just And it's not just in our ministry, but it's happening everywhere. And the Lord said, you will preach in 14 churches. Now, I've already preached more than 14, but he said, you'll preach in 14 churches and I am going to put a special 2014 anointing on their church and on the ministry of that church. And he said, all 14 will be coming out of great conflict and battle and struggle and they will be on their upward swing and you will speak to them. These goosebumps are just they're just breaking out all over my body right now. I don't have to have a goosebump to say this, but I'm telling you, they are just all, even on the top of my, when you get them on your ears, whoo, something's going on. They're all over my ears right now. And the Lord said, you're going to speak to 14 churches, and I haven't spoke, not even to 10 yet. But uh, Thursday night, the Lord spoke to me. In our meeting Thursday night. My God, did we have church Thursday night. I, 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 you don't have to tell me, but I appreciate those that came up and told me of your miracles Thursday. And even those that came up and told me what God did Wednesday night. But in that Thursday service, God spoke to me and said, this is one of those 14 churches that are going to receive a double portion. He said, Sunday morning when you minister you will speak the prophetic word of the double portion over this church and every individual, every family represented, the body of Christ, the administration of the church, the ministry of the church, the praise, the singing, the, all the worshipers, every aspect of this church, the school, the daycare, everything about this church is going to be anointed, baptized with double portions. Anybody want to lay claim to that right now, just right in the first utterance of the prophetic word of God? I want to take that home, Brother Winslow, to my house. Trust me, God could give you double for what you have received from the Lord. Don't ever think that. And always, it's always greatness of God always manifests itself after great battles. Jesus on the cross. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel, and on and on and on it goes. So God spoke to me, and I always try to just listen to God, do exactly what God tells me to. Five times in my ministry, God spoke to me and said, don't say a word. Don't even say welcome, hi, or anything. Walk up there. Don't say a word. All five times, the Holy Ghost has fallen in those five services, and God just took over, and I never said a single word. Of course, you know how Pentecostal people are. After church, they would come up and say, what a great message. That's the best preaching I've ever heard you do. And laugh and walk off. Sorry, dogs. Just trying to make a point that God's preaching is better preaching. Hallelujah. And I agree with them 100%. But God spoke to me about this service, about the double portion, about 2014, about Sister Nelson. God told me about the, the great move of God that's in this church and is coming to this church. And, and the Lord said, everything that I do is spoken first and then it happens. I didn't create this world without speaking first. I speak and then I move. And he said, I'm going to speak this morning and you let me speak and I'm going to speak to this church. And I'm going to crush the enemy and I'm going to give victory to my house and victory to my souls to my people, and I'm going to heal, and I'm going to fill with the Holy Ghost. You should never stop what God's doing just because you don't understand it. You should never stop what God's doing for you because you, you, 
you, you, you, haven't, uh, you haven't been taught it. You should never. Number three, you should never stop what God's doing for you because of circumstances. If God starts baptizing with you with the Holy Ghost, I don't care what church you go to, what your background is, you should never stop a divine sovereign act of God who wants to fill you or heal you or bless you or touch you. We've got to learn, even Pentecostals have to learn because we start thinking about how we failed. No, we're unworthy. And, but if God chooses to do something, you should never let anything in your mind, your body, or your spirit, or anything anybody's ever said about you or what they'll think about you to stop God from doing what he wants to do because he knows what we need more than anybody else does. Will you do your best? You don't have to make a promise, but will you do your best this morning not to stop anything God's trying to do for you? Will you let God do it? I don't care if you hung a dog yesterday. If you ask God to forgive you and if you'll let the Lord touch you today, will you let the Lord touch you today? He's got a purpose for it. He's got a reason. He knows what he's doing. Don't stop God from what he's doing. And so it was a few months ago that this whole service, this anointing of God was just prior to 2014. I told you in November, God always speaks seven things to, to me about the coming year prophetically. He told me about the political unrest that was going to happen at the end of this year and uh, some of the things that were going to take place in America. He talked to me about the anointing of God, the miraculous, the miracles, the double portion, things of that nature. I don't go around writing those things down because they distract people. People just start looking at those things, and, and, uh, but I, they are there for me to minister. They're, they're given to me not to write them in a book or announce them, or, but they're there for me to have more authority in those areas so that when I recognize them or they start happening, I know God's already prepared me, and I move into that and start believing that in Jesus' name. So almost beginning of the year, this around November, or even a little before that, I, I woke up and I, I you know I'm a creature of habit. I do the same thing all the time, and uh, it's just the way I am. I, I used to wear the same shoes, buy them at the same place. Till my son ridiculed me to death, and I bought a little bit more modern shoe. But I'm I can tell I'm moving back to where I was. And uh, you know I wear. I was at one church. One lady come up to me. She said I asked the pastor. He gave me permission. I want to take. Uh, you and buy some suits, meet you somewhere and buy you some suits. And so we got there at the place and I said, well, thank you so much. He said, well, you don't have very many suits. And I said, I do have a lot of suits. She said, well, you wear the same one. I said, no, I wear the same color. She said, what? I said, I just don't know. I just like black, navy. I said, I've got other color suits, but it's just, I just like wearing those. They don't show the dirt. And, um, and I said, you could crumple them around in them and everything else. They're easy to match up. I said, I'm a terrible matcher. And they're just real easy. They go with everything. She said, oh, oh, I thought you didn't have but one or two. I said, she started walking off. I said, wait a minute. You can still buy me something. I did get in the car. She said, oh, no, I'm going to find somebody that really, Bob, I had to open my mouth. Why couldn't I just be quiet and get blessed? See? I didn't do what I told you to do. But I did the same thing. I did it this morning. Same thing I'm telling you about I did this morning. I did it yesterday. I did it the morning before, the morning before that. Every now and then, I, I can not do it, but it's what I do. First thing I get up in the morning, and I tell my God, thank you, I praise him, I talk to him. And, but it's not long I get dressed and I go to McDonald's. Now, I, I can drink. Expensive coffee, it's not that I can't do it. Just don't, for some reason, I don't like it. It's bitter. Well, I, it's not because I'm a cheapskate. And I just want cheap coffee. It just happened to be, and I th I'm thankful that I love the kind of coffee that's cheap. I just thank God. Just thank God for that. And I'm not putting nobody down or knocking anybody, but I go to McDonald's every morning. And I get my senior cup of coffee. Come on, somebody. 
I get that senior cup. And what I like about McDonald's is it's a good cup of coffee. It's not too harsh. It's, it's inexpensive. And it's the same no matter where I go. And there's more McDonald's than there are any other kind of coffee places. So I have no problem. And I, I usually, I hate to say this, but I usually drink around three to four cups a day. I can literally drink a cup of coffee at 10 o'clock at night and be asleep at 11. I, I don't know. I'm just weird. You know that already. And uh, so I get up like I did every morning almost, and I go down to McDonald's. I'm actually preaching in Los Angeles. And I go in there, and I carry the same thing with me. I carry my Bible. I read the Bible through in a year. Every date has Scripture. You read that date, and by the end of the year, you've read the Bible all the way through. It's a personal conviction that I have that everybody ought to read the Bible through every year. Even if you can't read the Bible because of some hindrance, you can get, you can get it on CD. But I just know that it will bless you. It blesses me. I can't do, I can do without my coffee, but I can't do without my scripture. And if for some reason I get busy and I, and I get up in the morning and something unexpected happens, I don't read my scripture all day, I'm mad. I'm just, I'm just mad. Because I got to get to my fix. I got to read that word because it, it does, it, I promise if you don't do it every day, you do it and see if within just a couple of months, and here comes these goosebumps, in a couple of months, and you see if it doesn't do something for you because when you stop doing it, you can recognize it. And so I get my read the Bible through. I get my iPad, and, I, and I'm old school too. I'm new school and old school, and I get paper and pen. If I'm reading some kind of article or book, I take that with me in case I just want to get into that after I read my scripture. But I read my scripture first. So I, I go into McDonald's that morning. Sister Winslow actually was with me. And we had just got through preaching. We were in the process of preaching uh, 22 services in 24 days. That's not bad for an old guy. Woo, come on. I was raised in a generation that played baseball. And uh, so uh, I, I told her, I said, honey, I said, we're, I mean, she just, she said, I, I don't know what you're made out of. You're, this is ridiculous. I said, what, being in church so much? No. You just jump up in the morning and you go to bed late at night and you bounce out in the morning and you get up there and you preach like a madman every night. Prophesy, pray for people, dance in the spirit. After church, you're talking 90 miles an hour to everybody. What are you made out of? I said, I got the power of the Holy Ghost in me. She said, well, I got it too. I said, well, dial it up then. Crank it up. Like the woman told me one time, you are rubbing this cat the wrong way. I said, turn the cat around. Because, baby, this thing's going the same direction. And uh, I said, well, you just stay in bed, sleep late this morning. You don't even have to get up. I'm going to go down to McDonald's, have my cup of coffee, my sausage McMuffin. I'm going to read my scripture. Read a little bit, but, you know, whatever. I said, run by the church and pray. And sometimes I'll just go to a strange church I've never been to and go in there and pray, whatever. And uh, but anyway, so I I get up there, I'm in line, I get my stuff, I got all my stuff under my arm, and I go back in the corner back there and I want to get in, dig in, drink that coffee and eat that sausage mac muffin and um, and read my scripture for the day, and then I'm gonna just kind of whatever I feel like I need to do for the next 35, 40 minutes, hour or so. And the, as soon as I get my coffee and I'm walking back to sit down, the Lord speaks to me. He said, I'm going to show you something that you asked 40 years ago, but I never told you the answer, and I'm going to tell you today. I froze and right there just froze, and not even knowing what God was going to tell me. The tears started just running down my face. 
the little girl wiping the tables looked at me and said, Mister, are you okay? I said, yes, ma'am, I'll be all right in just a minute. Is everything all right? I said, I don't know, but I think they're going to be good. She said, well, are you sick? I said, no, ma'am. God just spoke to me. She said, oh, come on, and walked off. I lost her there. But how many knows, I didn't care if she believed it or not. I walked over and sat down, and tears in my eyes, and 40 years ago I asked God something, and he didn't tell me. The Lord said, I'm going to show you something in the Word of God, and I'm going to give you a recipe. I'm going to give you a, a formula for something. And then I want you to use this formula to bless my people. And I'm going to take your ministry to a level it's never been on after I give this to you. And you're going to see tremendous breakthrough in your children and in your grandkids. And I'm going to tell you what, Pastor, when he said, let's pray for the grandkids, the kids, the grandkids, he had my heart. He's a man of God because he can see into those dimensions. That's why he's a pastor of this church. That's why you ought to hold him up every day. Fight every battle for him. Don't let nobody put a finger on him. Stand up for him because if you stand for him, God will stand for you. And so I, I sit down and the Lord said, read this scripture. Now I started reading. God said, turn to the book of Job and start reading the book of Job. I told the Lord, I, I, I don't want to read the book of Job. I said, I am Job. I don't want to read Job. I want to read something else, something good, something great. Not Job had many afflictions and trials. The Lord said, I said, read the book of Job, and he wouldn't say nothing else, so I read chapter 1. I didn't hear or feel anything. Chapter 2, same thing, 3, 4, 10, 20, 30, 40, 41, 42 chapters in the book of Job, and I read every one of them right there and had three cups of coffee. I mean, I was ready to be lit. I was... That'd be a great time to be preaching. And I said, Lord, I just read Job and I saw nothing. You just let me read the whole book of Job and there's a purpose in there. And I, I, nothing st stood out, jumped out, spoke to me. And he said, read 10, chapter 1. Hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. As soon as I started reading that, from the power of the supernatural, I saw many of your enemies packing up their bags, breaking the camp, and moving out. I literally saw that right now. That just the reading of it let your enemy know it's over for us. We're going to have to move on. God's fixed to break up this thing. You like to see your enemy broken and the power it has over your kids broken this morning in the name of Jesus? That's exactly what's going to happen. Hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side and thou hast blessed the work of his hands? His substance is increased in the land. And I read that verse when the Lord said, read verse 10. I said, well, Lord, why don't you just tell me verse 10? He said, I'm going to tell you why in just a minute. But I'm going to talk to you and I'm going to tell you the five things that the hedge of God is made of. I'm going to tell you why the hedge comes down. I'm going to show you how to put it back up. When he said that, I started crying because I remembered. Forty years ago, when the enemy came in and attacked me and attacked my family, and I looked at God because I didn't know any better. I hadn't learned yet. This is a battle. 
And sometimes the Lord will let the enemy come in so that he can be trapped. You'll think it's God allowing the enemy to win when it's really God entrapping, snaring your enemy and defeating your enemy at one place in one time. Also, God will use it sometimes to lower the hedge, to allow you to feel what everybody else is going through. If we lived in the blessings of God every day, we would never have the empathy. We would never have the compassion. We never have the drive for revival. We never want to see a move of God because we are so heavenly blessed. We cannot see the hurt and the pain that's going on around us. So sometimes God lets the hedge come down so you can, it's not, God's not going to leave you. The hedge's going to go back up. He's not forsaking you. He's just letting you feel what everybody else is feeling. How else could you pray for somebody successfully unless you've been there and went through that yourself? Your pastor's ministry has doubled in the last five years since he walked by faith with his God. He's twice the minister that he was a few years ago. And he's got twice as much the compassion and twice as much the understanding about your troubles and your problems and your situation. This is not a time, not that you are, but this is not a time to get rid of someone that God has sowed into your life that has been there, done that, understands that, has compassion for that, and has been able to walk up and out of it. So sometimes we, are, we, we go through things, all of us, that are nothing more than God allowing the enemy to be drawn in so he can defeat them, just like the five kings that came against Israel. And the Lord permitted those kings Together, not to defeat Israel, but so that they could be defeated all at one time in one place. So the Lord's telling me this. I let that come down for that reason. Then he said, I'm going to give you the five components of the hedge. And he said, first of all, I want you to see in verse 10 that the hedge is about you. It's all around in every direction. And it's not just around you. Look at verse 10. It's not just around you, Job 1 and 10. But it's also around your house. Don't you know, I read just this week, don't you know the Bible says that a saved woman sanctifies an unsaved husband and sanctifies the kids? And a saved husband sanctifies an unsaved wife and sanctifies her kids? That's how powerful the anointing of God is in this church. That anybody that walks in the doors of this church is in the house of blessing and is surrounded by the glory of God and is in the midst of the miraculous that anything could happen because you're inside the hedge. God said, my hedge is made of five things. I'm going to give them to you, and I want you to preach it when I tell you to. Of course, everything is under the unction of God when God says. There are churches I've preached for the last few months. I've never preached this. I never said it to them, not because they're unworthy of it. It just wasn't the time and place for it, something else for them. So God said, I want you to get ready because this thing is around you and your house. And look, it's on every side. I want you to see the confirmation. I just want to watch. I want you to see how your pastor is walking in the supernatural. What did he say before I came up here? Let's pray for Brother Winslow. For him, his wife, his children, his grandkids, even his horses. When he said that, I went, And the Lord said, don't you understand what you're preaching? I went, oh, yeah, the hedge is around everything. He said, the man of God's already hooked up. He's already ahead of you. My God, get that smirk off your face and get up there and get ready for the Holy Ghost to take over. <laughs> Unbelievable how these confirmations happen in the house of God, isn't it? It's crazy stuff. And so I, I, he said, tell my people the hedge cannot be penetrated, cannot be broken. We've got people here today that you came out of car wrecks. Everything in your car was demolished but where you were at. 
the hedge of God was there. Some of you should have been dead by now. Cancer, diabetes, trouble, trials. You went through a horrible situation in relationship, but you didn't lose your faith. You're still in the house of God. You're walking with God. You're serving God because you had a hedge around you. But if you everything happens by faith, everybody say faith. You doubt, it crumbles. You doubt, you don't get your miracle. You doubt, you don't get your financial breakthrough. Everything is about faith. It's the devil's business to make you think you don't have a hedge and the hedge is not impregnable and it's not around you. It's your business to tell the devil, I'm a child of God and I've got a hedge around me, devil. It's real. I know it's real. I was in a... Uh, Metroplex. I was in this large city and I was in the church and, and we had a couple nights off and I was in the church and I was there late at night, real late. And I, I, I'm, I'm kind of different. I just kind of like to get all the lights off and I don't have to think about nothing, just get my mind on God. And I had all the lights off and I was walking out the door and, and uh, I, I didn't turn any lights on. And I kind of was just kind of seeing through the darkness. And there was a man standing in that vestibule with the side door of the Pastor left open for me to come out to go out and he or to come in and then told me how to lock it when I went out. And so I I was walking through the darkness and I knew I could sense there was someone in that darkness and but I couldn't see them and all of a sudden they spoke out to me and they asked me if I was ready to die. And uh, I, I wasn't even thinking. But I just said it so calmly. I said, I'm ready. I've got the Holy Ghost. I'm living for God. I'm full of God. God's living inside of me. I said, but what about you? Are you ready? And I want you to know that the presence of God came into that vestibule and the glory of God. And I didn't say another word. And I saw that figure run out that door and, and run out down the parking lot and left. The hedge of God. Or when the man came up to me and fired five direct shots into the door of my car. And not one of them touched me. Shot all around me but never touched me. And dumb me, I'm so stupid. He's shooting at me and I said, I'm not going to be afraid. God is with me and I'm just driving off waving at him. Just driving slowly. Dummy. Huh? Huh? You can have faith and run as fast as you can, just like walking. I just drove off waving at him, I, I, and I'm telling myself, I ain't letting the devil see I'm afraid of nothing. Now, that's not, I know God's probably saying, that poor thing. angel, put your cape up right now and protect him. Poor thing. When I drove off, when I went to the, get my car repaired, he said, my God, that looks like bullet holes. I said, it, it, it was, it is. It looked like somebody shot all around you. They did. They didn't hit you. I said, I'm here, aren't I? He said, you're a little bit of a smart aleck, aren't you? I said, no, I just got God on my side and I'm just assured. How much will it cost to fix it? God's hand on my life. Three times in uh, major car wrecks. Uh, I'm not bragging. I don't want to have any more testimonies. These are enough. Please, God, no more of these great testimonies. Let somebody else have some. Some other preachers. But God helped me. He enabled me. He put a, a wall of protection around me. And I said there'll be some this morning that their hedge is no longer there. And by the time they leave this morning, their hedge is going to be back up. And you're going to speak to them. You're going to tell them how to get their hedge up. And any time their hedge comes down, they're going to know my hedge is made of these five components. And they're going to go down the checklist. And they're going to make sure that hedge is in complete operation. Get ready. Your enemy doesn't want you to know how and what the hedge is made of today. And remember, it covers you. 
and your house and, the, and everything you possess, just like the pastor said this morning, he was doing nothing more than prophesying my hedge into great power and authority. He may not have recognized it, but he was enabling, he was anointing, he was empowering my hedge. Because you walk with God, you can bless your children. Because you come to this church, it has an effect on your kids and on your life and your family. It's not a lucky charm. It's the glory of God. And so the Lord said, write this down. Well, I got my paper out and I started writing. He said, number one, Psalms 34 says, The angels of God encamp round about them that fear God. My hedge is made of supernaturalness. You want me to tell you what the strongest component of this church is and has always been? That it believes in the power of the supernatural God. This is a supernatural believing church that worships in the dance, that worships running the aisles, that worships with the praise, that worships with their hands raised because your hedge is supernatural, your God is supernatural, this church is supernatural. You gotta make sure that you believe in the supernatural. You gotta believe in angels. They encamp round about me. Number two is found in chapter one. That when God gave permission and allowed the hedge to come down momentarily. And Satan came in against Job. I mean even Satan told God. Well as long as the hedge up I can't do anything. That's why I just, God just showed me in the supernatural. Your enemies packing their bags up because they know they've heard this message. They know what God's about to do. He's about to put hedges up. He's about to enforce and power the hedges. He's about to give you authority to speak hedges up around your family, around this church. So the first thing that happens when the hedge comes down, I've got to hurry up. When the hedge comes down is, the first thing that happened is that the Bible all of a sudden says, right after verse 10, all of a sudden it says, the Sabaeans come. And they come down out of the mountains and they come down and the first thing they take is the gold? No. Silver? No. Job's kids? No, not first. The first thing they were after was the animals. And I, I'm sure the Sabaeans were not walking in revelation, but they were being directed by demons. And the first thing they took was the animals because the second component of the hedge of God is the blood of Jesus Christ. And in Job 1, it says, Job offered sacrifices unto God Every day for his family, his house, his life, everything about him, he offered up sacrifices unto God through the blood that he sacrificed on the altars. And the first thing the enemy wanted to take away was that blood. And the blood of Jesus is part of your hedge. You ought to pray the blood every day. You ought to pray the blood over your house. You ought to pray the blood over this church. You ought to pray the blood over your family, over your marriage, over your loved ones, over your finances. There's power in the blood of Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? The blood. The blood, the blood. You want me, devil? Come on, but you're going to have to swim through the blood. You want this marriage? Come on, try to get it. But you're going to have to walk through blood to get it. You need to turn the blood loose on your loved ones. You need to go by and start pleading the blood over them. 
I pray every morning the same prayer since that day. I pray for my, myself, my ministry, my wife, my, everything the bishop, everything the pastor said, all the prophetic things he was speaking for me. See how the, see how the Lord is? What I was going to do for you, God's doing for me. Even before I could get up here, just your pastor's a quicker draw than I am. He just got the gun out first. The blood of Jesus is the second thing. Then you find in chapter 22 that God tells Job three things to do. There are five components of the hedge of God. He tells Job, pray. Keep your vows and make decrees. And those are the five components of the hedge of God. It's the supernaturalness of God. You've got to believe in the supernatural. You've got to believe in the blood of Jesus. Your hedge is made of the blood that was shed on Calvary. Number three, it's your prayers. Number four, it's your vows. Number five, it's your decrees. We know what the angels are in the supernatural. Is We know what the blood of Jesus is. Your prayers are those daily prayers. I heard a great man of God. If I told you his name, you know who he is. And I understand what he was trying to say. But he made this statement. And when we make statements, we have to be careful what we say. He said you ought to pray something one time and never ask God again. And I understand what he was trying to say. But every ounce of Holy Ghost in me spoke to me and said, that's not correct. Because you have to keep praying your prayers sometimes. It's when you stop praying that your enemy's momentum catches up to you. It's not over till the rapture. It's not over till he comes back. And you got to pray that one more prayer and pray that one more prayer. My mother on her deathbed, 78 years old, all the boys were in there. She called us in there, and, we, and she said, I'm, I'm going to be going home to be with Jesus tonight. I said, oh, no, you're not, Mama. I won't let you go. She said, you got nothing to do with it. She said, I'm your mama. If I say I'm going, I'm going. You hear me? I can't get up and whip you, but I'll hire somebody. I said, well, Mama, we love you. We don't want you to go. I know, but it's my time to go. I'm leaving here tonight. I'm gone. She said, gather everybody up. I want to pray a prayer over every one of you. And she prayed a powerful prayer and talked in tongues. The same prayer I heard when I was 18 and drunk one night came in, laid in my bed, and there's the wall. My mother's on the other side. And I heard my mother crying and praying, Jesus, don't let anything happen to Gordon. Jesus, please save him. Jesus, no telling where he's been. And she was weeping and crying. And I felt that same power and that same compassion. She had never stopped praying. Even though I was a preacher, I was living for God. She was praying that prayer. And God spoke and told Job, keep praying. Don't stop praying. Your hedge is Your hedge is filled with your prayers. And then your vows. I'm not the pastor. It's not my, I'm not trying to pastor this church. I couldn't do it if I wanted to. I'm not called here. But your vows is your offerings. It's your attendance. It's your service to God. It's your promise to hold the House of God up with your prayers and your attendance and your offerings. And it's your vows to serve God no matter what. You know, we made vows to each other in marriage. Through the good times, the bad times, and this and that and all this other stuff. Because everybody's got any sense knows you've got to make a vow. You've got, your, your vows are going to keep you. And the Lord said, your hedge is made of vows. That means on a tough night on Wednesday night when you got every reason to stay home but you don't you are affecting the power of your hedge when you show up don't you dare get in a car after this morning 
and tell your husband or wife, I shouldn't even went this morning. I didn't get a blessed thing. I didn't feel good. I've been sick all day. You shut your mouth. Whether you got something or not, your hedge got empowered by your vow. And I'm tired of these devils stealing from us the promise of blessings, telling us that your giving doesn't affect your supernatural walk with God. That's the biggest belch lie from the pits of hell. When you sow an offering, you affect everything about you because giving is faith. It takes faith to give what God has asked you to give. You may not be able to buy a miracle, but every dollar you put in that offering affects your hedge. It's part of it. And number five, and I've got to get ready to close, number five is the one that the Pentecostals have the hardest problem with, and that is making decrees. It's hard to speak faith. It's hard to say God's going to get me out of this when it doesn't look like he is. It's hard to say when you're laying up in the hospital bed, you've been prayed for 543 times. God's not going to let me die. It's not easy to make a decree. Or to walk up to your loved one and say, you're going to get saved. You hear me, buddy? You're getting saved. I'll never go there. I walked in a service one night, and uh, this man, he said, are you Brother Winslow? I said, yes, I am. He said, you're the preacher tonight, right? I said, yeah. He goes, well, I'm going to tell you something right here now. I came tonight to visit. Don't be calling me out. I said, okay, I believe God's going to answer your prayer. He said, I'm going to tell you something right now, preacher. I hate when they call me that. Preacher, let me tell you, preacher. I'm going to say, okay, sinner, what? He said, I'm going to tell you something right now, preacher. He said, you ain't going to see me dance around here like a monkey. I said, oh, my God, whoops, whoa, he just messed up. I looked at him like, he said, what? Nothing. I walked away, but that night the power of God hit. His head was down and tears started flowing, and he jumped up out of that pew and started. I went. I'm serious, he was going. I couldn't help it. I, I shouldn't have done it. I asked God to forgive me. But I run down there and I, tap, I had to tap him a few times. And he finally looked at me and I said, you're dancing like a monkey. He said, I am, ain't I? It just went on. God filled him with the Holy Ghost. I don't care what the devil says. I don't care what facts say. I don't care what doctors say. I don't care what lawyers say. I don't care what the enemy says. Stand up in front of God in the center of your hedge and make the decrees of God. Speak what the word says. Speak what the man of God says. Speak what the spirit of God says. And your hedge, your hedge will be empowered. Everybody just get to your feet right now. I want you to lift your hands. I got one little phase of this message to finish. And it's one of the most important phases of this word before we step out in faith and start believing God this morning for the supernatural. I want you right now to put your faith around what I just spoke. If you want God to watch over you, you want healing to come into your house, it's not Brother Winslow calling you out that's going to get it done. It's what you think before I ever show up. It's what you say before I ever get there. It's your faith. It's your worship. It's your, your countenance before God that's going to make the difference this morning. Right now, I want you to wrap your faith around what I've preached to you, and I want you to see the hedge of God that's around you in Jesus' name. 
And I want you to start seeking the Lord and say, God, put those five things in my heart and in my spirit that I can start proclaiming those five things and operating in those five things in my life so that my heads will go up around my job. My heads will go up around my marriage. My heads will go up around my walk with God. It's not that I don't have battles. I do. But they just get taken care of so fast. God just shows up. I'm so undeserving of them. But ever since that morning a few months ago, every day I start with that hedge prayer around my family. Now get your hands up right now. And I want you to pray those five things in Jesus' name. I believe in the supernaturalness of God. Lord, I plead the blood of Jesus Christ over my life, my worship, my family, my marriage, my children, my health. In Jesus' name right now, Lord, help me to pray. I know I'm not praying like I need to, but God, help me to start praying if it's five minutes a day because it will affect my hedge. Lord, let my giving, let my vows, let my attendance, let my promises be yea and amen because they're going to affect my hedge. And let me make the right decree in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Come on, let's praise him, everybody, right now. Give me about one minute of Holy Ghost praise in the name of Jesus. And I'm going to change gears in the final part of this message. I can sense that healing. I can sense that healing virtue just like Thursday night. I can sense that healing virtue of God beginning to just move out through this congregation right now. If I was to tell you God's going to heal someone of hepatitis, would you dare believe that right now? Everything that the drug addiction in the past has done to your body and your mind and your lungs, God wants to heal it this morning right now in this service. Come on, make some decrees right now. Tell the Lord, this is my double portion morning. I want a double portion. I want to dance. I want to worship. I want to shout with a double portion this morning. Now reach over there and pray for two or three people right now in the name of Jesus. And I'm going to close this message. This last part, this small part of this message is the most powerful, profound part of the Word of God, the hedge of God that's going up around this church today in a mighty way. Lord, I ask you to touch these two, these three people right now in the name of Jesus. Touch their heads, their family, their health, their spiritual walk with God. Lord, I decree it, I declare it, I speak it in Jesus' name. Now clap your hands to the Lord and give him a thunderous applaud of faith and praise in Jesus' name right now. I want our musicians to get ready. Our, our musicians, our, our singers, get ready. Be seated. Let me, I got to finish this. So God spoke those things to me, and the um, first day I started praying them. I mean, I prayed them right there in McDonald's. I prayed around my kids, my grandkids. I prayed around my ministry. My ministry has never been so effectual as it has been since God spoke that revelation to me. I, I, just, I, I just, I can't tell you. I mean, every preacher knows when he's in a level he's never been in and he's in a place of, of God that he's never been in. I mean, every preacher can tell you that. They know that. And ever since I started praying that hedge of God and I, I, I plead that blood and, and I speak and decree things unto God and I speak them out for God to do them and I speak things of faith. I've laid hands on myself and prophesied to myself I, because I couldn't find nobody else. I'd get in the mirror and, of course, you don't do that when nobody can see you. And I, I got in the mirror and I said, oh, you right there. I'm calling you out, brother. Me? Yeah, you. You handsome dog. I didn't say that. I'm just kidding. I said, I'm going to lay hands on you. You're going to feel the Holy Ghost get a hold of you. I believe it. And I lay hands on myself. And I mean, I could, whoo, man, I was powerful. I could feel the Holy Ghost making decrees. I've been, I did that the first day. I had no idea how quick it was going to work. 
I prayed it the second day. Third day. I prayed it on the third day. Prayed it that morning. Oh God, put the hedge up around my, my brothers, my sister. Put up around this one, that one. I was, I was praying all those prayers. At that, late that afternoon, the Lord spoke to me. I'm just driving back to my hotel and the Lord spoke to me. And he said, I want you to call Carol. And I want you to preach to her. I want you to just ask her, will you be baptized in Jesus' name? Carol's my only sister, and she's the oldest. I'm going to tell you, when you've got only one sister, that's bad. But when you've got one that's the oldest, it's terrible. <laughs> Bossy. Right now. You know, them older sisters, they use their head. Going to do it. You know what you do? Because you know there's a two by four coming. And my sister, when I first got the Holy Ghost 40 years ago, that happened 40 years ago. When I first got the Holy Ghost, she'd ask my family over to eat, cook supper for us. And I was sitting in there in the living room waiting on the supper, and I was reading the Bible, and she walked up to me and she said, What are you reading? Oh, sweet, nice. And I said, I'm reading Jesus' name, baptism. I wasn't even trying to preach to her. She kicked me out. You get up right now, you and your wife and kids, and get out of here. I said, are you kidding me? She said, no, I'm not kidding you. Get out. And don't you ever bring that subject up to me ever again. It was her that when my mother got the Holy Ghost, that she went to my mother and said, they're the Antichrist. I said, Mama, I'm, I'm the Antichrist. No, Gordon, she didn't say you. You know how mama, mamas are. She didn't say you're the Antichrist. Your church is. As if she was, you know, I said, well, my God, Mama, that's terrible. That's not better. Well, at least it's not you. You know, that's how mamas tell you. Your foot got run over, but at least it didn't run over your head. That's how mamas are. And she kicked me out. I said, don't you never bring that up. I mean, for 40 years, I never said a word to her about Jesus and baptism, about the Holy Ghost. I just would never. Now, she's my oldest sister. Do I love her? I loved her. She loved me. No, yeah, she did. Did we see each other, hug, have meals together, birthdays, mamas? Every, yeah, but never brought it up. But I put her inside that circle. On that third day, that third afternoon, God spoke to me and said, I want you to call Carol and don't preach to her. Just ask her, will she be baptized in Jesus' name? Man, I was like, wow, I know that's the voice of God. I, ooh, God. Oh, I don't want to call her. It was my sister. My, she's my older sister. And it was my, you know, my mom, my mom worked, and it was a bunch of us boys, only one girl. My sister had to clean the house up every day. That's what she did. We did the yard and stuff like that, but my sister did that. And here's what she did. Once she got the house clean, she'd lock the doors with all of us on the outside. We couldn't, we couldn't get in. She'd lock the windows. We'd tap on the window. Carol! What? We're hungry. And she lifted up and gave us a little bread and peanut butter. We're thirsty. The water hose. I'm proof that you can drink out of the water hose. It's not going to kill you. You're going to live. We drink hot water out of the old stinky water hose and a piece of bread and some peanut butter. Worst beating I ever got in my life was she forgot one of the windows and I was crawling in and she took a two by four and hit me with it and beat me out the window and shut the. That's my sister. Do I believe she loves me? Yes. And I loved her. But I never brought up that stuff because she just jumped me. And so the Lord said that to me. I'm driving. I'm thinking, oh, God, hallelujah. I just think, oh, I felt like I was going into the battle of Armageddon. I said, oh, Jesus, oh, God, what do I do, Lord? Oh, God, go before me. I mean, the Lord already spoke a word. So you know what I did? I called my brother Jim, who lived in the same town where she lived. I said, Jimbo, yeah, what's up, Gordon? I said, look, God wants you to do something. He said, what? I said, God's got a mission for you. And what is it? You're supposed to go by and see Carol and ask her to be baptized in Jesus' name. He said, I'm not going. Uh-uh. You got thrown out of the house. I'm not getting thrown out. She had never forgotten about that. I said, you've got to do it. I'm way over here. 
and uh, you you got to do it now. I said, now look, don't go in there and preach ever. I'm not going to go in there and preach ever. You can guarantee you're right I'm not. He said, I'll tell you what. He finally gave me and said, I'm going to go in there, and I'm going to sit down, and I'm going to say, Carol, will you be baptized in Jesus' name? I said, that's what God said, do. So he said, all right, I'm going in. A few minutes, the phone rang, and he said, Gordon, she said yes. She'll be baptized in Jesus' name. I said, wow, the power of the hedge. I said, well, look, I'm going to be preaching about an hour and 45 minutes away from our hometown. I said, ask her if she'll come up and be baptized when I'm preaching that revival, which was like two weeks away. And she said, yes. So she shows up. And I, t- I just looked at her and I just started crying. I couldn't help it. I was just thinking about my mama. I was thinking about mama. I said, mama, mama's got to be so happy about this. And, I just, and once I started thinking like that, I could just see my mama's face and her face then. And all of a sudden I could see my mama there. I told her, you look, you look so much like mama right now. And, and so I, I choke up. I can't hardly talk. And I told the pastor, he was going to let me baptize her. I said, I can't do it. I can't do it. I know I can't. I'm ter- I got something in my throat right now. So we got up in the baptistry. I said, we're not going to wait to end the service. I said, I won't give the devil no time for her to leave. So just right as soon as you get ready, we're going to do it before I preach. So we got up there, and I was here. And then here was the man of God. And then here was my brother Jim. And Carol was in the baptistry. It's unbelievable what it's going to do for this church. And uh, so here my sister in there, and I'm just looking. I'm just clogged up, choking like crazy. He goes, I baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ, remission of sins. Under the water she goes. My God, I'm just looking at her going, my God, that's my sister. That's that back beating with a two-by-four girl right there. Glory to God. Throw me out of her house. Said, don't ever mention it ever again. And I just said, God, that's the power of the hedge. I'm going to pray it every day. I said, God, anytime you tell me, I'm going to preach it. I'm going to wait for you to speak it because you've got to do it. But I'm going to. And so she comes out of the water and starts speaking in tongues and I mean, the power of God, I wept, I cried. I mean, it's not going everywhere. And all of a sudden, you know, a good time went by. She's still praising. And they're singing that same song again and again and again and again and again. And the preacher's looking at me like, you know, and, and you know, there's a certain amount of time you kind of supposed to get out. And so I thought, oh, my God. I mean, it's, you know, I'm talking about my oldest sister now. I don't care if she had the Holy Ghost or not. She's still, hey, I can do it. I'm going, what do I do? So I just, I put my arm around her. I said, oh, hallelujah. Ooh, it's good. I said, baby, in just a few minutes, not very long, maybe three you're going to feel something tell you to get out of baptistry and the spirit's going to lift and you can just come out. She turned and looked at me. I saw it was the oldest sister. She said, Mister, do you want me in or out? You've been wanting me in and now I'm in and you want me out. Do you want me in? Do you want me out? A fear was all over me. I said, in? That's what I thought. And she lifted her hand and started praising God, speaking in tongues. I said, Brother Hines, she'll be out when she wants to get out. Go ahead and close the curtains and change the song, and we'll just go and have some church and praise the Lord. When the Lord and her gets ready, they'll come out. And I could see her nodding her head. She spoke in tongues, and boy, there they go. God filled her with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. My grandson, I've, I've got to get ready to close because God's going to do something really powerful, something really great here in the next few minutes. And 
just the next, next day, I believe, the next day or the day after, my daughter calls me on the phone. One of my grandsons had OCD. He had it bad. He'd wash his hands and wash his hands and wash his hands and wash his hands. And she'd tell him, don't, don't, you don't have to wash your hands. They're not dirty anymore. If you touched his glass, he wouldn't drink out of it. If you touched his plate, he wouldn't eat it. Sometimes he'd go two or three days without eating anything. And when the hunger got so bad, he would give in and eat. And, and he was just fighting OCD so bad. If you don't know what it is, it's, it's really bad. And we'd been praying for him and believing God. But I put him in that hedge from that very first day. And now just four or five days later, she calls me on the phone and said, Daddy, I was at a prayer meeting here at the church in Austin. She, she goes to Brother uh, Bernard, Brother Shaw's church. And I said, Daddy, we was at a ladies' prayer meeting. And Dad, God don't ever tell me anything. But Dad, I think I heard the Lord tell me during the prayer meeting, Christ is healed. Dad, what do you think? I said, well, where are you at? She said, I'm on the freeway right now. I said, well, praise God, honey. That's got to be God. The devil's not going to tell you that. And I said, I told her about the hedge real fast. I said, I put you in the hedge and, and Brian said, go home. She said, what do I do? I said, I don't know. She said, I know what I'll do. I'll touch his food. I'll drink out of his glass. And so they're eating something and, and uh, she goes, I'm just going to eat a little bit of this. And she grabbed it and ate it. And he goes, well, Mom, you want some of this other too? She just went, oh, my God. She said, no, what I want is a drink of this. That's He said, that's all right, Mom. And he picks up drinks after her. And she goes, oh, my God. And she looks at Bryce and goes, Bryce! I told later, my God, you scared him to death. Bryce! My God, you're healed! He said, what, Mama? You're healed! Watch this! Now eat some of it. He ate it. But watch this! Now drink some of that! He goes, Mama, I'm healed! Yes, you are. And he was healed. Come on, somebody. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. God said, I'm fixing to put up a hedge around this church. I'm going to give you power to put hedges up around your husband, your wife, your children, your family in Jesus' name right now. Let's stand, everybody in the building. Everybody stand with Brother Winslow right now. This is it right now. We're fixing to move in the Holy Ghost. And I'm going to ask everybody to just have faith and believe. I can't, I'm not going to get upset with you if you don't come. 